Well, first and foremost, I want to give all glory, honor, and praises to Yahweh, Bahashem, Yahweh Shai, double honors to the apostle elders of Great Millstone who rule well, and salutations to all you brothers out there pushing this word in love, truth, sincerity, and humility. Once again, it's the brother Shai Thick coming back from the Chicago camp, coming back to you with what I hope is another quick and edifying sit down. And uh, as I woke up this morning, I got on YouTube and I was just scrolling through the video feed. And this video was recommended, you know, YouTube, depending on what you watch, it recommends videos from certain channels that you probably don't even know exist until they suggest it. And of course I had to, I had to check this out strictly on the title and it says, uh, well, from the damage report, uh, this is my first time hearing of this channel and it says America dying of whiteness. And I had an opportunity to take a look at this video. And basically, you have Bad Uncle Esau, who is the so-called white man, talking about how you have other Edomites, in particular the middle class and the low-level Edomites. They are so stuck on Edomite privilege and consumed with hate toward Israelites that in their pride they will support legislation even if that means their own demise. <laughs> it, this was, you know what, I'm going to just let some of this uh, video play. Actually, I'm going to let the whole video play. And uh, interject with some scriptures. We've been wondering for many years, what is the matter with Kansas? And a new book uh, sheds some light on that. We're joined now by Jonathan Metzl, Director of Medicine, Health, and Society at Vanderbilt University, and author of Dying of Whiteness, How the Politics of Racial Resentment is Killing America's Heartland. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, very glad to have you here and talk about this subject. So, Dying of Whiteness, what is that about? Well, it's it's basically a book about how the politics that claim to make America great again, and particularly white America great again, end up, if you just study the kind of aggregate effects of what's happening on the ground, end up being risk factors that make working class lives, and particularly working class white lives in some instances, harder, sicker, and shorter. I'm somebody who's from the Midwest. I grew up in Kansas City. I live in Tennessee. <clears throat> Excuse me. And basically what I did was just started tracking what happens if you live in a state where you block the affordable care. Act and don't allow for the uh, expansion of services, or you let a lot of guns in, or you have massive tax cuts that help really wealthy people but end up cutting roads, bridges, and schools to everyday people. And it turns out that those policies themselves are as dangerous to working class people as are man made risk factors like asbestos or secondhand smoke. And the irony of the book is that the greatest drop in life expectancy in some of those instances were among the white uh, working class voters who were supporting these. GOP politics in the first place. So now you just heard that, right? To make a long story short, this man is telling you that Esau and all his pride will support any type of legislation that does not benefit anybody else other than them, even if that means that they're going to suffer. And as this uh, uh, Edomite just said, even if it's to the point where they die, okay, he said that the highest uh, group of people that are killing themselves and suffering the most from legislation that's supposedly not supposed to benefit uh, uh, minorities, as they say, are, are you, you low-level Edomites. So we're going to go to... We got to go to Obadiah 1, okay? It says, I'll start from 1. It says, Obadiah 1 and 1. It says, The vision of Obadiah, thus saith Yahweh power concerning Edom. Edom, who, that's, that's bad Uncle Esau, the so called white man. It says, We have heard a rumor from Yahweh and an ambassador sent among the heathen. 
Arise ye, and let us rise up against her in battle. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. Okay? These folks are dying off. Not only, uh, or should I say, they're small. Uh, not only because their uh, uh, reputation, okay, being an Edomite is not a great thing, which the world is very quickly found out. Not only that, they're small because their numbers are drastically dying off. Okay, suicide, opioids, death of despair, alcoholism. Okay, it says that this is the point. It says the pride of thine heart have deceived thee. Thou that dwelleth in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? And for many of these Edomites here in Babylon, the snake, which is America, they are totally disillusioned. As I said, in many sit downs, these, these Edomites suffer from a bad case of cognitive dissonance. Okay, they don't want to hear the truth. They don't want to hear about anything, any type of situation that can benefit them, even if that means that other people get to have a little bit of something for themselves. Mm -mm -mm. No, not bad, Uncle Esau. You can't have that. Okay. And his habitation is high because he, he's in the power seat right now. But the thing is, that's not all Edomites. Okay, it's only the uh, elite and the elite of the elite of the nation of Edom. Those are the ones that are really sitting on high. You low-level Edomites just have the so-called benefits of Edomite privilege. But as you can see, it's really not benefiting you. That saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? It says, though thou exalt thyself as the eagle... Because many of you Edomites think that your shit don't stink, for lack of a better term. That you're the greatest thing since sliced bread. And though thou set thy nest in the stars, that space bra, thence will I bring thee down, saith the hour. And the thing is, it's a beautiful thing because you, not only is this truth bringing you all down, you all within yourselves are bringing each other down. All right, you literally have Egyptian versus Egyptian going on right now. You all are divided amongst yourselves. And when you combine that with your pride, <laughs> the main people that are suffering from your politics are you. Let's, 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 let's get back to this video. Well, that was a that was a great uh, preview of some of the specific policies. So let's talk about uh, what you found. So you spent years uh, going to these areas of the, the country and talking with people. And what are some of your explanations as to why people continue to support the policies that, that in your words, are literally killing them? Well, a good part of it had to do with underlying uh, anxieties, not just about um, race or racism, but this idea that basically minorities and immigrants were going to come and take away um, resources that were due to working class people, very often working class white people. I'll give you one example. Um, I did about um, two or three years of research in Tennessee around the time that the state was debating whether or not to adopt the Affordable Care Act um, and, and the resultant Medicaid expansion. And I did focus groups with people who basically told me that even though they might have benefited, some people I spoke with were incredibly medically ill, and they told me, even though this program might help us, um, we're going to vote against it in a way or support politicians that do because, and this is a quote, um, we don't want our tax dollars going to what they said were Mexicans and welfare queens. And so part of it was just this idea. And you already know who they talking about. Even though, statistically speaking, bad Uncle Esau is the number one person on welfare, OK, especially not only here in America, but especially funding them fake gutter rats over there in the state of Israel. OK, those are the biggest welfare people. But we all know who he's talking about when they said they don't want any type of benefits or welfare to go to uh, Mexicans and welfare queens. He's talking about you, uh, uh, black, Hispanic and Native American women. All right. So even with this, he's saying that, oh, it's not necessarily hate, uh, uh, racism, but it is. 
he said it's more fear, but yet it's a fear based in and is seated and rooted in racism. So it's still racist. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah, of racial resentment. The problem with that logic was when they started, I mean, we're all kind of connected in this world, right? And so the minute they started defunding the healthcare system in the state, in effect, um, their health suffered as well. And one of the most shocking findings I found in the book was that blocking the expansion in Tennessee ended up costing the average white person in the state about three weeks of life expectancy. And so there was this trade-off where basically people were telling me, um, we don't want those services going to other people other than ourselves, than ourselves you know, lazy minorities, stereotypes like that. But it ended up uh, boomeranging and, and, and hurting them as well. So one of the most interesting... See, all the wickedness in, in that, that's, that you planned for Jake, all right? It's happening to you, okay? You're so... You... <laughs> hey, the, the, the Most High is beautiful, okay? He made Bad Uncle Esau's personality so destructive... Combined with that pride that he put, he put the, 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 how should I word this? He's made bad Uncle Esau put himself in his own trick bag. Because Esau can't do good. And he has so much pride that he won't do good even if it means hurting himself. And the thing is, when he gets mad about it, <laughs> he can't see who's the problem. On top of that. His own nature won't let him let go of his pride. Uh, let's uh, get a precept on that. I think it was in, was it in Psalms, I believe it was. Uh, yep, Psalm 10 and 2. It says the wicked and his pride doth persecute the poor. Remember? And the thing is, these low-level Edomites don't realize they're also poor too compared to the, the uh, elites like those Rockefellers and Rothschilds and Oppenheimers and DuPonts. Okay? It says the wicked and his pride doth persecute the poor. It says let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. So like Judas, you guys are hanging yourself with your own rope. The man said, if it came down to having a quality of life that the majority of the people will benefit from, you Edomites are so dumb and prideful you would rather have your health go, your infrastructure go, and many other things fall by the wayside. That in the long run is going to hurt you. You would rather have that happen than let any type of legislation pass. <laughs> that was so-called help, as you say, Mexicans and welfare queens. Hey, that's why the Most High is, is, is taking you devils out, man, with a vengeance. And see, it, it gets to the point where you have nobody to blame but yourself. This is an Edomite. As they say, your, your own tongue is falling upon you. This is an Edomite going on air confessing that his own people are so prideful that if pretty much they can't have everything and if everything can't strictly benefit them they don't want it and they don't care no matter how bad they hurt well you know you can hurt to your own destruction for all i care and i'm sure if you are israelite man or woman in your right mind you feel the same way let's get back to this video Interesting things is that so you're you're giving examples of how racial resentment can lead to these outcomes in particular states, but that you're not saying that it necessarily says anything on the individual level about feelings of personal individual level racism. So how do you differentiate between those two things? That's exactly right. In other words, I make very clear in the book that probably a minority of people I spoke with expressed some kind of overt racism. And most of the people, I have to say, um, were, were not thinking about that. They weren't, they weren't racist as far as I could tell. Um, 
yes, they didn't display any type of overt racism, blatant racism. But the, the fact of the matter is, is that all of them feel that way. Okay, I used to work in a psychiatric hospital. Very quick story. I used to work in a psychiatric hospital. I won't say where it was, but uh, I used to meet a lot of Edomites. And they were, some of them were, for lack of a better phrase, in their right mind. And then some of them were. And the ones that will come in and they're so-called right behind, they will be angry and upset. And when they wouldn't get their way, the first thing that comes to their mind is, get out of here, you fucking nigger. God, I can't stay, you niggers. Nurse, get somebody else in here. Or when they come in like totally off their rocker, whether they be legitimately crazy or under the influence and the, the the first thing they come in here and say, fuck you niggers. The white man's better than all of you. Fuck you niggers. I can't stay. you. Get your hands off of me. Get your hands off of me. I don't fuck with you niggers. You think you should shit, you niggers, because you got a job? I'm better than you. Fuck you niggers. And then when they leave the hospital, seven days later, they want to shake your hands about... Oh, thank you. I just love the good work that you all do in here. You all have an excellent program. And I'm up here looking at this guy like, he truly doesn't realize what he did. He was, there's an old worldly saying that says, when a person shows you their true colors, you believe it. And when these Edomites will leave the hospital, they don't realize that you showed us your true colors. And... There is a great majority of them, probably, I haven't seen it in all of them, which not to say it still doesn't exist because it does, but a lot of the examples that I've seen that came through that hospital, they were racist, flat out racist. It was deep seated in their heart and in their conscience. It just took the right moment or the right thing to bring it out. The issue, the big risk factor, it was about the policies, not the people. In other words, if you elected a politician whose policies were based in, for example, taking a lot of resources to try to block immigration in your state, taking away a lot of money that was going to pay for infrastructure, and taking that money and using it for tax cuts for wealthy people, um, and defunding you know, infrastructure, the schools that your kids attended, factors like that. Um, so part of what I argue in the book is that these policies were based in a kind of underlying anxiety about race in America. Um, and the risk factor wasn't whether or not you yourself had that attitude. It was whether you lived in a state that had those policies that, that ended up affecting your health. And I think probably the most tragic part of my research for me was these were direct, disastrous consequences. I also studied Kansas, for example, um, where um, people rallied around this massive tax cut that defunded infrastructure across the state. And it, it collapsed the state. It lost all of its credit rating and factors like that. But instead of saying, gosh, what's the matter with Kansas? We don't want to replicate that. All of these disastrous policies ended up becoming the framework for policies that are now being furthered at the national level by the Trump administration. And so, in a way, these were the canaries in the coal mine for nationalized policies. So, uh, one final question I think is important to ask you. Uh, so, how do we fix this? <laughs> well, Part of, part of what I argue, you know, people ask me when I wrote this book, what are we going to do to change people's, trust voters' minds? And, you know, I don't want to go change people's minds. Well, that's pretty much it. But we all know that you, you can't fix the situation. Okay, this was destined, this meaning America, Babylon the snake. It, it, was, it was meant to get destroyed even before it was created. And we're going to get, let's, let's see what we can get, maybe a few more. Yeah. 
You know what? I'm going to get that one in Proverbs last. But uh, I want to get this one in Ecclesiastes 10 and 7. It says, Pride is hateful before Yahweh and man, and by both doth one commit iniquity. And how is a bad uncle Esau committing this iniquity? He's helping, he's helping in his ignorance to further Edomite supremacy. As the man said, even to their own detriment. <laughs> you, 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 you ha you're in a position where you benefit from Edomite supremacy, but yet you vote in favor for every single law that will not benefit you as long as uh, uh, as long as, as it is it doesn't benefit anybody else, you'll support it. If it benefits other people, you won't support it. Hey, that's why I said before the Most High is jacking you devils up. And now that's why we're going to go to that Proverbs. Proverbs 16 and 18. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And hey, you, you devil has been prideful for so many centuries to the point where, as the man just said, you all are prideful to your own destruction. And it says, and a haughty spirit before a fall. All right. And as that man just said, you all have fallen off terribly. Each and every single time you support your own kinsmen, it's to your own detriment. But your pride has blinded you that you can't receive that message. And because of that, hey. You devils are about to get wiped out. All praises to Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Shai. So with that being said, I want to give all glory, honor, and praises to Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Shai. Double honors to the apostle elders of Great Millstone who rule well. And salutations to all you brothers out there pushing this word. And love, truth, sincerity, and humility with that. We're going to say Shalom.